Good morning. <laughs> hey. Well, I'm Colleen Foster, the president of CRA, and I'm here along with my board member, Matt. Manuel Medrano with the city of Chula Vista. <laughs> San Diego in the house. <laughs> I'm also with City of Oceanside. Yeah. So anyways, thank you. We are day two, CRA 2019 in Rancho Mirage. Um, it's been an exciting, amazing event thus far. There's been amazing content. Um, and it's just so great to see all of you here in this room. Again, we've got probably one of our highest participation rates and membership rates tonight, right now with CRA. And we've got some of the best sessions. I was just in an amazing session you know, about markets, and there wasn't even standing room. So it's just phenomenal to see that, phenomenal to see how engaged our industry is. And the other thing is I noticed there are so many new faces in the room, and I've been really enjoying the opportunity to meet new people. And so it's exciting to see our industry um, just grow in that fashion. So I would say we're halfway, th well, would we say we're halfway through? No, not really. There's a lot of great content still left. And tonight, the way I'm going to find out how, how, what the rest of the day is about, because I downloaded the XD app. Did anybody have a chance to do that? <laughs> yes, <laughs> awesome app. So but, no. go ahead. No, no. Well, what do we have left? Got all kinds today? of stuff left. All kinds I mean, of stuff, you name yeah. it. Let's we see. A well, a, a big point is uh, the NICRA players, right? We have a, yeah. <laughs> it's all about the party at the end, yeah. the dance yeah. party. Yeah. <laughs> Any, any, uh, we said any we're going to give a little hint of what Maybe we, the, like, there's uh, a little bit of Rat Pack costumes, maybe, just a tad, I don't know. <laughs> hey, she dropped that hint. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot of great sessions. Yeah. We've got a lot of great school programming sessions, um, reuse, multifamily recycling sessions. Really, the issues that we're going to be talking about today and the presentations we're going to be seeing impacts each and every one of us on our daily right. lives yeah. within our professions. So thank you again. It's your content. Um, your submittals that really make this conference, you know, um, stand out above others. So we really appreciate you here again today, and we're looking forward to another amazing day, right? Yes, we are. And, and I think Manuel, I don't know if you all agree, but after Trash Monologues next time, I think, you know, he's a great host for, like, open mic night, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, um, I'm going to be introducing our first speaker of the day today. Um, it is with a great honor to be able to introduce Scott Smithline, our director of Cal Recycle. Scott Smithline was appointed director at the California Department of Resources and Recycling and Recovery in July 2015. He formerly served at the department as assistant director for policy development since 2011. Smithline was a consultant at the Smithline Group from 2008 to 2011, Director of Legal and Regulatory Affairs at Californians Against Waste from 2003 to 2008, and an attorney at Lawyers for Clean Water in 2001. He was a fellow at the Golden Gate University School of Law's Environmental Law and Justice Clinic from 2000 to 2001. Smithline earned a Juris Doctor degree from the Golden Gate University School of Law. We all know Scott Smithline in our industry, and he has been a phenomenal leader at the top. So we are very pleased and honored to hear, hear have him as our guest. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Bear with me. I'm trying this for the first time. It's going to look at my face. Hold on. Here we go. Or it's, I thought it was going to. There it goes. All right. All right. Um, maybe I'll do it this way. That works. I'm giving up paper. I'm trying to give up paper. So I'm, this is the first time I've ever actually tried this. It's going to work. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you, CRA, very much for inviting me to be here today. Thank you all for coming. Um, I feel a little bit out of the frying pan into the fire after that morning session. Um, <laughs> if you were in that session, you can go get coffee or something because I'm pretty much going to repeat what we just talked about. Um, but no, I'm, uh, I'm really happy to be here. CRA was, uh, I think I've said this before, uh, but CRA was my first conference when I got into the world of waste and recycling back in 2003. And I just always have the warmest uh, feeling coming back to the people of CRA. Many are new, some are the same. Um, and it's great to see everybody and um, to be here. 
I'm also pleased to be in the desert. <clears throat> I grew up in the desert. I'm a, a desert rat. I grew up in Tucson, Arizona. So I just really like to, to be in, in the open space in the desert. So. so I was asked to make some opening remarks this morning, which I'm pleased to do. There is plenty to remark about, as everybody knows. I think we'll start at the top. Um, let's, let's talk about National Sword. So uh, China says they don't want the West's garbage anymore. And they've done something about it, right? They have a new series of policies and regulations limiting the importation of waste-based materials, very strict contamination standards. And I know a lot of people are very frustrated and have been offended by the rhetoric associated with not wanting our garbage, but the fact of the matter is, when we're exporting material that costs more to cleanly and safely process and bring to market than it's worth when it gets to market, it is kind of like asking people to take our garbage. It's not just China. Many, com many countries have been rejecting uh, waste-based materials over environmental concerns. And frankly, I think we need to applaud any effort to improve environmental conditions anywhere on the globe. Yeah. Thank you. Does it present real and significant challenges to all of us here uh, in California? Absolutely. They're real and they're present, present challenges for us. Um, and there's more, right? We've seen commodity prices fall, uh, traditional commodity prices, whether you're talking about PET or aluminum or certainly mixed, mixed commodities, mixed plastic, mixed paper, they've fallen, they've sus sustained lows for years. The only thing that's fallen faster than the price of recyclable commodities is the price of virgin plastic, right? Which just compounds our problem. This in and of itself has had significant consequences, right? If you are alive um, and in this world, in the last week, you know that Replanet closed. Replanet was the largest provider, the largest single provider of recycling centers for the bottle bill in the state of California. We lost over 280 recycling centers with one closure. I'm not gonna get into the press around that, some of that press for obvious reasons. Um, there's no question that this is a considerable hardship for the businesses, for those employees, and for the consumers in the state of California. I will just say that we at the department have been and continue to be focused like a laser on ways to improve the beverage container recycling program and we will continue to, to do that. On top of all that, we have a strong economy. A strong economy means more generation. More generation means more disposal. We are seeing disposal rates in the state of California now that we have not seen in over a decade. We're looking at over 40 million tons of disposal. We're back to that in the state of California. So do we have our challenges? Yeah, we have our challenges. But it is not all doom and gloom. Um, there are bright spots and there are opportunities. We are looking at implementing landmark organic recycling legislation in the state of California. We have 1383. How long have we been trying to get organics out of the landfill? Since I started, I, in, I inherited that mission from a guy named Rick Best at California's Against Waste when I started in 2003. So yeah. We, the department, have been working for the last three years to find a way to implement this program that's the least onerous, the least burdensome on industry and local governments, and we're going to continue to do that. But we intend to finalize that rulemaking this year, and 1383 will be uh, the new law of the land. We're talking about universal commercial and residential organics collection in the state of California. In addition to that, we have SB 54 moving through the state legislature, right? This is comprehensive approach to packaging, uh, uh, packaging legislation has 17 co-authors. We have 792 moving through the legislature requiring minimum content for plastic beverage containers. At the federal level, we're even seeing proposals uh, to deal with plastic products and pollution requiring phase-outs of single-use products, requiring uh, EPR programs, even proposing a national deposit system for uh, beverage containers. So what does all this mean? To me, it means that we are a time of change. This is a time of um, increased awareness and momentum uh, in industry, with media, with the public, and I think at all levels of local government. I think this is a serious an opportunity, in other words, to advance uh, environmental protection policies that I've seen in my career in the, waste, uh, in the waste sector. So I think it's important to ask ourselves, advance policies to what and from what? Next year, sorry, next month, 30 years ago, we passed AB 939, right? 
AB 939 gave us this concept of diversion in the state of California. I would argue that diversion is still one of the primary metrics we use to measure ourselves in the state of California. If it's not buried or burned, it's diversion, right? All diversion is created equal. Source reduction is the same as recycling. All recycling is treated the same. Bottle to bottle closed loop recycling is treated the same as uh, a bottle to a single used plastic product or that's gonna be disposed or a PET carpet that's gonna be disposed. And frankly, you don't even need to recycle. You can take a, a pile of mixed materials, bale it, put it on a container ship and export it, and it's diversion. But as we now know, there have been unintended consequences associated with our collect, sort, and export model for these traditional commodities. We have inadvertently been contributing to the under-regulated, in some cases the unregulated, disposal and burning of solid waste. And we've been contributing into economies that employ substandard and in some cases totally unacceptable labor practices. So we want to move on. And it's, it's easy to get stuck to figure out exactly what problem we're trying to fix. If I were to ask everybody in this room, we're going to have a new sustainable materials management policy. What should the priorities be? I would hear about climate change. You would tell me about conserving energy. You would tell me about reducing litter, certainly marine pollution, right? You would tell me about jobs, economic benefits, um, air pollution. So I'm going to try and keep it simple. There are a couple things that we are focused on right now that are going to be important no matter what, no matter what policy we employ. And I think the first is that whatever approach we pursue, recycling is going to be a key component of that approach. So we need a modern, meaningful working definition of recycling in the state of California. In addition, just as importantly, we need a meaning defini meaningful definition of the word recyclable. When we say something is recyclable in the state of California, we should know what, exactly what that means. If we allow someone to label their product recyclable in the state of California, a consumer should know what that means. Last year, this little modest bill, SB 1335, passed. 1335 requires state food service facilities to only use food service packaging that's reusable, recyclable, or compostable. And it directs this department to develop definitions for those terms, and it provides us guidance on what those terms should look like. Under 1335, to be considered recyclable, packaging needs to be regularly collected, sorted, processed, and regularly used in an end product, right? It will be insufficient to claim that this package is feasibly recyclable or technically recyclable, whatever that means. This uh, you know, idea that we're just gonna look at the qualities of a material to determine whether it's recyclable won't work under 1335. We're, we're forced to look at whether the material is actually being recycled and put into an end product. So the point I'm making here is that I think that principle, that we need to make sure that if we're gonna label something recyclable, that we're ensuring that it's actually being recycled should form the foundation of our future policies for recycling in the state of California well beyond the confines of state food service packaging. <clears throat> and the second point, um, and the last point I wanna leave you with this morning is that we need to get serious about source reduction. No matter how effective our public education is, no matter how much we invest in and improve our collection and sorting technologies, no matter how much we invest and expand domestic reprocessing capacity, no matter how much we do all that, we cannot, and I, I don't believe that we should, simply follow around in the footsteps of the products and packaging manufacturers and try and build an infrastructure <laughs> and try and build an infrastructure to manage the growing volume and complexity of materials that they're putting into the stream of commerce in California. So we need to have a hard conversation about single-use packaging. Um, we need to we need to have a conversation about how much we're consuming, whether it's recyclable or not. And this will be the most technically challenging conversation that we've had. This is one of the hardest things for us to approach. It's not only technically challenging, but it's the most provocative conversation. 
and it's the most culturally challenging conversation. But of that, I mean, it, it requires more cultural change than anything else we're gonna be asking of people. But it's time to commit to this because consuming less will always be the best option uh, for our planet. So again, it's easy to get distracted, um, but what I'm focusing on, what we're focusing on, is restoring recycling to what it should be and shifting away, providing a cultural change from single-use wasting. So I hope you get out a lot of this conference and I thank you very much. It did okay. It was okay. Because I haven't had any of those yet today. Uh, mics are on. So we're going to be running some mics. I do want to just say that if your comments turn into a dissertation, we will be ruthless. Okay? So raising hands. I got my hand. Martin Bork, Ecology Center. Um, thank you so much for bringing up uh, source reduction and, and you know, reduce, reuse, recycle was the hierarchy that this whole thing was, was founded on and we've really gotten to just, you know, everything being quote unquote recyclable. So I appreciate the definition, focus. What is the uh, CalRecycle prepared to do in terms of putting real resources and focus on refillables, on reusables, and on other forms of source reduction uh, to reduce packaging. So thank you for the question. Um, you know, as a, as a department within the administration, obviously we don't have authority to independently implement those types of programs. What I can tell you is that through all our conversations internally within the administration, um, and as we're developing policy ideas, those are the critical things that we're talking about. You know, last year, I think we crossed over 25 billion single-use beverage containers in the state of California. You know, are we okay with 30 billion? Are we okay with 50 billion just because we can recycle them? That's the question. So we're looking very closely at how do we incentivize reusable? How do we require uh, folks to come up with alternatives other than single-use packaging? Oh, sorry. A uh, very simple question on that. Uh, I had to pay our CRV deposit when I bought a growler and grumbler to get refilled at my local brewery, and yet, I am not able to use CRV money to promote the use of growlers and grumblers as reusable items in our local brewery. So here's a tangible way you can use CRV money to support reuse that is an opportunity yet to be seized. Okay, this is the last question. I'm sorry, I don't know where we are. Oh, hi. Hi, yeah, I'm just going to take it to the practical. Um, I, I want to use two examples and wonder what, what your vision is on how Cal Recycle can help. Uh, one would be the Amazon effect, mm -hmm. everything being shipped online, and we've taken uh, readily recyclable material, cardboard, and contaminated it with these air pillows. <laughs> uh, what can we do? Can there be reusable outlets? And then the other one I want to say, and I'm from Napa, so we're the poster child taking a perfectly recyclable wine bottle that has no redemption value to it. Can we solve these two practical and what can Cal Recycle do about it? So they may uh, be practical. They're, they're controversial issues that you raise. Um, the previous administration uh, did uh, at one point, uh, let's say, propose that we add wine and spirits into the, the beverage container recycling program. Um, you know, that, that's something that is uh, certainly on the table again for discussion. Um, I certainly don't have the authority to do that in, you know, at, the, at the departmental level, but it's something that we're certainly prepared to discuss. Uh, Amazon, you know, we've met with Amazon a few times, and I don't want to beat up on Amazon, but um, they were challenging conversations. Um, I'd still like to see Amazon have an independent standalone metric of the environmental performance of their packaging, right? They have something called, um, what's it called? God, I can't believe I'm forgetting what it's called. Um, well, I forget what it's called, but it's like <laughs> consumer friendly or, uh, oh God, someone, does you, someone know what it's called? Nobody? Frustration free packaging, that's what it's called. Frustration free packaging. 
Thank you. I'm frustrated with frustration free packaging. <laughs> Built into that metric of frustration free packaging are environmental considerations, but I, 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 when I met with them, I did ask them if they would consider having a standalone environmental metric uh, for their packaging. Um, you know, the cardboard is definitely recyclable. A lot of their other products, like that pouch, is still sorts out as a contaminant in, in the cardboard uh, realm. Uh, I asked them if there would be opportunities for the consumer to be able to return the cardboard to the warehouse for that to be reused as opposed to recycled because when I get it and I rip it open, it's pretty much in the same condition as it was when I got it. And so those are conversations that we've had with them. Thank you very much. Morning, uh, Executive Director for the California Product Search of Council, Doug Kobold, and I'm going to unfurl our flag again. <laughs> oh, there we go. Let's close. Okay, I think I can get this thing to stay. There we go. Okay, again, good morning. Thank you all for attending. Um, this is day two of the awards for California Product Stewardship Council. We love to acknowledge um, businesses and individuals that do a lot to further our mission, which is extended producer responsibility and product stewardship. And so, but before I finalize with our first, our last two awards, we did issue our award for yesterday to very deserving companies who are doing a great job for our environment and for our industry. But uh, we have two more to give out today. But I wanted to also do a special acknowledgement to um, one of the senators uh, for last year who really stood out and strongly supported SB 212. So if you don't know what SB 212 is, CPSC carried that um, bill last year, sponsored that bill, to have the pharmaceutical industry carry or support, fund, and run a uh, statewide medicine collection take back program and also a free needle container with every needle um, mail back program. So um, that was a great accomplishment last year. And not only was it uh, great work from Senator Jackson, uh, Assemblymember Ting and Assemblymember Gray, but um, we wanted to also acknowledge Senator Stone from your area because Senator Stone stood up there and championed as well this, this bill to get this program going for the state. And so we actually have a video. I think we have a video. I'm, saying, I'm, I'm seeing one minute back there, hang on. of the Legislative Leadership Award. This award means a lot to me. I'm a pharmacist by trade, so I understand very well what happens to communities awash in unwanted meds and charts, and the value of product stewardship programs that get unwanted meds and charts out of the trash, off the streets, and out of our water systems. SB 212 does this, and I'm very thankful for CPSC's hard work, determination, and perseverance in getting this law passed. SB 212 will hold producers responsible for the products that they produce, and I know that it will not only result in new jobs, but it will make California cleaner, safer, and a healthier place to live. It was a great pleasure to be a co-author of this bill, and I look forward to the positive impacts it will have on our communities. Thank you for this award and for this recognition. Thank you for your hard work on the material management front and for your commitment to making California the best that it can be, and for allowing me to be a part of your program. Thank you. Is my mic working? There we go. Sorry. Uh, we will be presenting that award to Senator Stone um, at, in a couple of weeks here, so in his office there at the Capitol.
Next slide. Looks like we're shifting back. This is why I don't embed videos in my, my presentations. Okay, well, so the cat's out of the bag. <laughs> I was going to state our Associate of the Year Award and who that was going to be, but you now see it. So I have the great privilege of awarding the Associate of the Year Award to Manuel Montrano. So Manuel is getting this award because he steps up in so many ways. Um, you know him as your vice president of CRA. We know him as our vice chair of CPSC. And there's never a dull moment with Manuel. He's always there to help out, answer any questions, get involved in whatever he's uh, uh, going for. And also with the board, I, I love his engagement. And so we felt it was appropriate to uh, recognize Manuel and all of his accomplishments and his contributions this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be brief because after today's session, you'll be sick of me. You'll hear so much of me up here. So thank you very much. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the work that uh, California Park Stewardship Council does. It's more important than ever to help us have a voice in Sacramento. So if you haven't uh, given some support, please support. Because as we, we heard, everything that's going on with plastics, with packaging, everything that we need, to, we need help with, we could, we, uh, uh, with their support, we could get there. So thank you very much. Okay, and our next one. Okay, and our and our next award goes for Partner of the Year. This is for um, a, either a corporate organization or a non-city local government type of organization. Um, and the commitment that they do, <laughs> uh, sorry, um, what, what contributions they give to uh, um, our, our organization and to California at large. Um, and so we wanted to recognize Cal Recycle <laughs> this year. So one of the reasons we're giving Cal Recyclers Award, they are a champion in extended producer responsibility and product stewardship. They maintain and are, are enforcing and over, have oversight over the paint, mattresses, carpet programs. They are right now in the midst of the joys of writing regulations for SB 212. That will be that statewide program. Um, a lot of hardworking staff doing a great job to make sure that the stewardship and uh, EPR programs run smoothly in this state and are successful so that we can continue to grab these products that are hard to manage, end of life, and add them to there so they get them off the backs of the local governments and into the manufacturers that you've heard so many times now today and yesterday. We've got to get back to the manufacturers to get them to change their, what, what they're doing and what they're doing to our industry and our environment. So again, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you are employed by Cal Recycle, stand up. Cool. Now just quickly come up here. Just quickly come up here. So I have said this before, but I think some of the distinguishing characteristics of Cal Recycle, including its culture, which existed long before I ever got there, was this sense of personal commitment to the work that we do at Cal Recycle. And um, there's another characteristic, I think, which is that we're a team. And we're not just a team within our divisions or within our branches, but we're a team across the department. And EPR is a perfect example of the re requires that teamwork, um, whether we're doing enforcement, uh, whether we're working with a program, or we're working with local assistance, whether we're working with a legal office, too much time with the legal office. Um, 
it's, it's, a, it's a team effort, and we, we, uh, we take EPR very seriously. The three programs that we currently implement are, uh, require a significant amount of resources from the department, but they're, they're important to us, and we want them to be successful. We're looking forward to implementing 212, and so I just want to recognize this, the staff that were able to come down this year, and on behalf of all the uh, professional men and women at Cal Recycle who aren't here today, um, we uh, humbly appreciate this award. Thank you very much. As Cal Recycle exits the stage here, that concludes the CPSC Awards for 2019. Um, I want to again congratulate all of our award winners. They were all very well deserved and looking forward to uh, awarding new ones next year. Good morning. I'm Judy Erlinson, City of Livermore. I'm the awards committee chair this year. Since 1976, CRRA has been privileged to present awards to individuals and organizations who go above and beyond in their efforts to prevent waste, reuse materials, recycle, com compost, buy recycled, and build green. Over the years, as our industry changes and involves, uh, evolves, as well as in recognition of individuals who have made extreme contributions to the industry, awards have been added, allowing us to recognize even greater contribution. I would like to thank all of you who submitted nominations. We thank you for taking the time and energy to share what's going on in your communities. It is not an easy task to pick just one in each category and we commend you for all that you do. I would also like to thank the awards committee. I don't know if some of you are here today. Uh, Debbie Jeffrey with Pleasant and Garbage Service. Mary Soul of Stop Waste. Tracy Swanborn of HF&H Consultants. And Michael Juan Seidler of the County of San Diego. So thank you. And lastly, I'd like to share just a bit with you about these beautiful awards. Each frame is handcrafted by Piece by Piece, a nonprofit organization from Los Angeles. Yay, right? <laughs> Their mission is to provide low income and formerly unsheltered people free mosaic art workshops using recycled materials to develop marketable skills, self-confidence, earned income, and an improved quality of life. So then these awards are threefold. They recognize excellence, promote reuse, and they create opportunity. Please visit piecebypiece.org for more information about these beautiful frames. And now I would like to bring our conference co-chairs, Colleen Foster and Manuel Medrano, back on stage to present the first award. See what I mean? I'm up here again, so. Yeah, got my steps in. <laughs> We're pleased to announce the recipient of the Dave Hardy Leadership in Organics Award. Dave Hardy was instrumental in developing the Organics Recycling Council of CRA and served as the organization's president. For his contribution, this award recognizes a business, government agency, community-based organization, or school that demonstrates excellence in the production, marketing, and or utilization of organic materials. This year's recipient is Solana Center for Environmental Innovation.
So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I prepared a, a few notes so I don't babble on. This is something I'm very passionate about. Um, I know that I'm preaching to the choir, but what can the choir do but, um, but sing, right? So hopefully we'll carry the message forward. Uh, here's what I, I want everybody to know, many of you do. When we harvest organic material, we pull resources, minerals, and nutrients from the soil, just as when we mine aluminum from the earth to create a soda can. If we landfill organic material, not only have we lost those nutrients we depleted from the soil it grew from, we create additional environmental harm from greenhouse gases released. It's actually worse than throwing inert recyclables away. My main point is that today we aren't recognizing the true environmental cost of wasting and of irresponsibly discarding organic material. But we're fortunate to be in California. I believe that driven by state legislation and the actions of California communities, sorting into that green organics bin will be second nature for our children, just as the blue recycling bin has become today. You all know all of this, I'm sure, but this message is what we need to impart to the larger community outside of this room and outside of the conference. There'll be a day when we, all, when we have landfills free of edible and compostable material. I hope that's sooner rather than later. Thank you for the recognition of Solana Center's role in this area. Good morning, I'm Nick Lapis, Director of Advocacy for Californians Against Waste and a CRA board member. I am pleased to present the Outstanding Waste Prevention Award. I'm especially pleased to present it to an organization that has been a partner to CAW and really an inspiration for a lot of the work we've done at the statewide level. This award goes to a business, government agency, community-based organization, or school that has taken the steps to evaluate their waste stream and has successfully implemented a program that prevents the generation of waste. And really, that doesn't encompass everything this organization has done. They've done a lot more than that. This year's recipient is the San Diego Food Systems Alliance. All righty. Well, thank you guys so much. The Alliance is honored to receive this award. Um, we'd like to thank our funders, our member organizations, and our community partners who support us to fulfill our mission of creating a healthy, sustainable, and just food system in San Diego County. And we are incredibly grateful for the recognition of our Wasted Food Prevention Program, which consists of initiatives that create efficient and comprehensive food waste prevention and recovery systems. I am very proud to report that we've prevented over 130,000 pounds of food waste at 15 of San Diego's largest institutions, big hotels like Hilton, Hyatt, universities, casinos, even our baseball park, Petco Park. And we are humbled by the fact that over 2 million San Diegans have been reached through our Save the Food San Diego educational campaign. Through collaboration, partnership, and innovation, we look forward to continuing the fight to end food waste. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Susan Collins from the Container Recycling Institute, and I'm also an advisor to the CRA board. And I am presenting the outstanding HHW slash universal slash electronic recycling award awarded to a business, government agency, or community-based organization to recognize innovation and excellence in diverting HHW slash U-waste slash E-waste materials from disposal. This year's recipient is Costa Mesa Sanitary District.
Thank you so much for this honor and recognizing the various programs that the Costa Mesa Sanitary District has available for its residents. It's an honor accepting this um, award on behalf of staff at the Costa Mesa Sanitary District. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Tracy Bills. I work for SCS Engineers and I'm the CRA Executive Director. I'm Mark Murray, I'm the Executive Director of Californians Against Waste. Um, we're honored to present the Outstanding Practices in Venue Event uh, Resource Recovery Award. Awarded to a large event or venue serving over 2,000 people per day for excellence in implementing waste reduction, recycling, and organics programs, innovative source reduction programs, recovering over 90% of event discards, and or other programs that demonstrate best practices in event or venue resource management. I had the pleasure of meeting Jenny, who's gonna be receiving this award on behalf of her company yesterday, and she's incredible in all the work that she has done. And I just wanted to add, as, as someone that is a, a participant in a lot of this organization's programs over the last 50 years, um, I, we really appreciate them in the Sacramento community as well as the model that they provide for events across the state of California. So this year's recipient is the Sacramento Running Association. On behalf of the entire Sacramento Running Association, um, thank you for recognizing our efforts and our events. The California International Marathon is a four-day event, it takes place across three venues and along 26.2 miles of course, so it's a significant undertaking for us. On average, we'll see about 20,000 participants, 30,000 expo go goers, and 50,000 spectators um, on race weekend. Um, Thanks to tremendous partnerships with Sac State uh, sustainability staff and volunteers and Green Waste of Sacramento, we are now a gold level sustainable event um, through the Council of Responsible Sport and could not do what we do without them and all of their support. So thank you as well. <laughs> Hello, my name is Leslie Lukash, and I'm the Executive Director of Zero Waste Sonoma and an advisor to CRRA. It is my pleasure to announce the Outstanding Recycling Program Award. This award is given to an individual or community who has significantly contributed to resource conservation throughout California. And it is my pleasure to announce this award to the City of Santa Cruz. Thank you for giving us this award. I'm happy to accept this on behalf of our outreach education and resource recovery team. We have great leadership um, and very knowledgeable leadership on our team. We call it the Vortex. We all work really well together. And I think that comes from um, the ability to think creatively, think outside the box. Three years ago, we recognized, like many of you, a huge problem with contamination. We rolled out a brand new educational campaign highlighting pictures of what we do and we don't want in the recycling bin and to help spread that message, we launched a master recycler volunteer training program. Those residents go out into the community and they help us spread our message and what we've learned through this program is that our citizenry is very interested in helping us do the right thing. So I encourage you to examine programs like this and bring it to your own cities. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Laura McCoyan, Principal of Envirolutions Consulting and proud member of the CRA Board. 
I'm here this morning to present the Outstanding School Recycling Program Award. This award is given to a school or entity that has partnered, or an entity that has partnered with the school that has excelled in implementing and carrying out a recycling and or diversion program. And I'm personally honored to be presenting this award. I served a brief stint at Stanford University and served alongside um, a mentor of mine, Julie Muir, and this year's recipient is the Peninsula Sanitary uh, Service and Stanford University. Thank you. It's an honor to receive this award um, in recognition of the partnership between Peninsula Sanitary Service, which is a small family-owned hauling company, and a big university, Stanford University, with 33,000 people, 8,180 acres. Um, our partnership, uh, we, through our partnership, we educate all of our students, our um, staff and our faculty, visitors, neighbors, um, to reduce waste and we create programs to reduce waste. And all of this is in an effort to achieve zero waste by 2030. So thank you, CRA, for your recognition. Good morning. I'm Monica DeVincenzi with Republic Services, a CRA board member and a program co-chair for this year's conference. I'm really excited to present the Next Gen Recycler Award. This award is specifically designed to promote the next generation of recyclers or zero wasters in California. It is awarded to an individual, young person, or youth group that set themselves apart from their peers in promoting waste prevention, recycling, composting, zero waste, or buying recycled. This year's recipient is local leaders of the 21st Century Club. children in our community from Girl Scouts to elementary schoolers to teach them about sustainability issues and how to properly sort their waste. We hope to encourage and inspire this next generation to be more environmentally conscious. We also have helped clean up the local creek and volunteered at various city and school waste audits to better our community and serve those around us. Our biggest project has been implementing a chai bin waste system at our school. We began by advocating at school board meetings for a new beaches policy, working tirelessly to inventory the place where we move in, conducted waste audits, and created a promotional material to educate students. We're local leaders in the 21st century. We hope to continue our mission of making the world a better place. <laughs> Hi, so we're just going to introduce ourselves really quick. My name is Lauren Landano. I've been a part of this club for two years. I just graduated. Uh, my name is Paulini Mansky. I've also been a part of this club for two years, and I, too, just graduated. And I'm Brian Luo, and I've also been a part of this club for actually two and a half years, and... <laughs> um, I just graduated too. <laughs> so um, we're really appreciative of this award. I just want to give a big shout out to CRRA um, for this nomination. Uh, we'd also like to thank uh, Debbie Jeffrey from Pleasanton Garbage Service. And we'd also like to thank our adult advisor, Miss Jill Buck, um, largely for all of her guidance and um, all of the leadership she provided for us throughout this entire project and how she kind of connected us with all the adults, kind of establishing a multi-generational solidarity, um, like this kind of environment where students and adults, like teachers and um, school staff and office staff, they're all connected, which is really crucial to the success of our project. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Tim Goncharo from Santa Cruz County, Secretary of the CRRA Board, and it is my pleasure to present our last award, the Pavitra Krimmel Reuse Award. 
Pavitra was instrumental in championing the promotion and implementation of successful reuse programs. In her honor, this award recognizes special achievement by a private business, government agency, community-based organization, or school in the reuse of materials. And this year's recipient is MedShare. stuff which is still usable is discarded. Wouldn't it be great if we could divert that flow of equipment and put it into the hands of people who need it? Mesha is improving the lives of many all over the world and also saving our planet. A lot of equipment that would have gone to the landfills in US, it doesn't mean that they are bad. It doesn't mean that they are obsolete. It means that they want to upgrade from one series to another. Not just take that material and have it recycled into something else, but have it be reused to save someone's life or to make their life more comfortable and healthier. So that is a win-win over the 10 years. Maybe 3,000 tons of material just didn't end up in the landfill. It wasn't recycled, it was reused to help communities and health. Good morning, my name's uh, Ernesto Oliveras, and I'm the Western Regional Director for MedShare. Unfortunately, Mr. Charles Redding, our President and CEO, and Eric Talbert, our Regional Director, was not able to attend today, but I humbly accept this award on behalf of the 100 employees and over 10,000 dedicated volunteers that make this all possible. Thank you very much. We're going to do something really fun that we've never done before, and we're going to take a selfie. So we need the last five rows to please get up so you can come out in the photo. It's a stretch break, too, so take it as that, please. But stay where you're at and just get up. Last five rows. There we go. Excellent. Cool. Want me to count? Was not on the script. <laughs> Here we go. Smile. One, two, three. Yeah. <laughs> Wait for it. Here, energy. <laughs> cool. Thank you. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, Ryan Hickman from Ryan's Recycling. Wonderful young man. Um, he's 10 years old. He's already the president of Ryan's Recycling. That's awesome. He began recycling at the age, tender age of three with a passion to clean up the planet. Uh, Ryan has, been, uh, has recycled over half a million cans and plastic bottles and uh, also travels around the country speaking about the importance of recycling. He's been named as uh, the, one of the top 100 most influential people in Orange County and he's a recipient of, a CN, of the CNN Young Wonder Award. Ryan is a youth ambassador, already a youth ambassador, wow, that's awesome, uh, for Recycle Across America and the Bush Systems. Please help me welcome Ryan Hickman. Thank you. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Ryan Hickman. I'm the president of Ryan's Recycling Company. You weren't probably expecting to be listening to a 10-year-old kid like me today. Well, I've had my business for seven years. I, I see a bunch of you guys doing the math right now. Yeah, I was three when I started. Well, this is how I got started. My dad took me to the local recycling center for the first time with a couple bags of cans, and I loved it. And I just wanted to keep doing it. And I also got all my neighbors to start recycling for me and my whole entire school. <laughs> I want to tell you guys a little bit about how or what my business does. 
Well, I recycle cans, bottles, and glass, and my dad drives me around to all my customers all over Orange County. <laughs> then I bring all my bags of bottles, cans, and glass to my house to be sorted, and then when I have enough uh, big bags, sorted materials, I bring it all to the recycling center uh, to cash them in. And I also travel all around, I travel all around the country teaching people how to recycle better, which I really like traveling, so it's perfect for me. <laughs> I also donate lots of money to the Pacific Marine Mammal Center in Laguna Beach, and And the Marine Center saves seals and sea lions from being sick and injured. They help them get better. And all the money from my Lions Recycling t-shirts that I'm wearing right now uh, gets donated to the Pacific Marine Mammal Center. And I donated about $10,000 so far. I know, it's a lot. <laughs> And I really want to recycle because I think it cleans the environment and I just don't want any litter getting into the ocean. And yeah, I just think I'm making a big difference by recycling and I just wanted to keep recycling right now. And I also do beach cleanups on the weekends when I have time. Sometimes uh, people help me out. If you guys want to help me out, on a beach cleanup, please contact uh, me and my dad on my website or let me know what Bush Systems booth later today. When my story went viral in December 2016, I finally saved $10,000 from recycling and it was about the time when my story went viral. I, I started getting thousands of emails each day from all over the planet. And I had so many interviews, I can't remember how many I did. My favorite one was with Ellen. She, she was pretty cool. Saving the planet by recycling all of your used wine bottles, plus he's super, super cute from San Juan Capistrano, California. Please welcome seven-year-old Ryan Hickman. So let's talk about, you have your own company, you're wearing your T-shirt, you recycle things. Why do you love recycling so much? Uh, uh, because it saves the planet and uh, it keeps bottles and cans out of the ocean for animals to not get sick or die. Isn't that beautiful? I love that you know that because a lot of people don't realize that when they throw things down on the ground and they don't recycle, it ends up in the ocean. It hurts the fish and the turtles and everything, right? And you, yeah. You care about animals. Why do you care about animals so much? Because we go to the sea lion rescue place and drop up money for uh, to rescue them. So, so then they could get medicine and food. Good for you. And I know that you uh, you started recycling. How old were you when you first started recycling? I was three and a half. Uh, my dad and me went to the recycling center, and we got home with maybe like five bucks. And then I went out into the street and said, uh, ta-da. And, and I said, I, I have my own business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you do have your own. When did you start your own business? This is it right here, right? Yeah. Yeah, when did you start that? When I was three and a half. You started at three and a half right away. Wow. That's in, in, and you have a business partner? Yeah. Who's it, that? My, my mom and my dad and my grandma. Uh -huh. And my future business partner is going to be my friend Wyatt. Oh. <laughs> Does Wyatt know that yet? Yeah, he, he knows. Okay, he does know. And, and what kind of things do you recycle? A cans, bottles, and glass, and wine bottles, because my mom drinks a lot of wine. <laughs> That's great. 
Hi, Mom. How are you doing? <laughs> All right, well, that's great. That's good she drinks a lot of wine because it helps you recycle. And uh, how much have you recycled since you started? Uh, 200,000 bottles. 200,000 bottles. That's a lot. How much money have you made? $10,000. $10,000? What are you going to do with that money? Buy a garbage truck. You're a smart fella, and you're going to buy a garbage truck with it? Yep. How much are garbage trucks? Uh, for a used one, it is 70000 For a new one, 120000 Wow. And, and you, the school, do you help the school out, or does the school help you out? Mm, I, I help the school out, and the school helps me out. Yeah, you help each other out yeah. with this. And you have a request for me, too, right? Yeah. What is that? Uh... Uh, to save all the bottles in the green room for me. Okay, because we recycle, but you want me to give them to you now? Yeah. Okay, because you want to make the money instead of us. Yeah. <laughs> you're smart. All right, well, uh, you're saving for a recycling truck. You're too young to drive a recycling truck right now. Yeah. Um, but we got you something that you can drive, and I know it's the color you want, and... Thank you. You're welcome. Let's go over there. Okay. So, so it's a blue truck because that's what you want, and you want the purple bins like that, so you can drive this around and collect that in your neighborhood. And one more thing I have for you. Shutterfly loves your inspiring story, and they want to help you with your business, so they want to give you $10,000. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. How many of you guys remember seeing me on The Ellen Show before you just watched that video? Some of you guys? Okay. <laughs> it looks like you guys? Okay. <laughs> Since my story went viral, my dad says I have about 200 million views on my social media videos. I've been in Time Magazine, National Geographic, and on ABC World News, and a ton more. I'm a CNN Young Wonder and an Orange County, or, and the Orange County Register says I'm one of the 100 most influential people. I don't even know what that means, but my dad says it's really cool. <laughs> I love teaching other people how important it is to re recycle, and I make YouTube videos and speak to people all over the country about recycling. Next spring, I'm going to be talking to people in Taipei and Budapest. Okay. I have some facts to share with you guys. You guys probably know these, but since they're really important, I want to tell you them anyways. It takes 90 years for a can to break down, 600 years for a plastic bottle to break down, one million years for glass bottles to break down. I know, it's a long time. And I don't know if all you guys knew this fact, but it takes 14% four, oh, of the litter that's in the ocean is actually stuff that could be easily recycled, just like a plastic bottle. And I have some fun, or oh, one fun fact for you guys. Can anybody guess how many cans of bottles I've recycled so far? I've recycled 600,000 cans of bottles. So far, probably by the time I'm 12, I sh probably would be sa saved a million cans of bottles. I may even be able to save a million case bottles before I'm 12. Who knows? By the way, I'm hanging out this afternoon at Bush Systems booth 19. Come by and say hi, and let's take some pictures together between 1 and 2 p.m. <laughs> I, I'd like to play one more video for all you guys. This one is a recent video from AOL Verizon. It takes 90 years for a can to break down. 
600 years for a pack of bottle to break down, and it takes 1 million years for a glass bottle to break down. I'm only 9 years old. If I could do it, anybody could do it. I'm Ryan for Cycling, and I'm a mini mogul. I just thought it was really fun, it was cycling, and I was feeling like, okay, I'm going to start my own company. So, that's what I did. How hard was it to start your own company? It, it was actually pretty easy. My dad took me to the recycling center for the first time with a couple bags of cans, and I just loved it, and I thought it was fun, and I wanted to keep doing it. Right after I got home the next day, when he got home from work, I ran out into the street. Of course, I can't say business then, so I said, yeah, I'm my own business. And that's when it started. Hi. Hi. Help with all these? Yeah. Let's say a customer finds out about my recycling business. They'll call me, I'll come and pick it up, I'll bring it to my house. When I have time, I'll sort it. You can put a V in the five cents if it's under 24 ounces. If it's over 24 ounces, like this, it's 10 cents. Ryan's uh, saved a lot of money from. Recycling. How many? How many have you recycled now? I recycled over half a million of these, mm -hmm. and it has gave me about sixty thousand bucks. Then I'll stack the bag up where I stack my bag. Sometimes for my mini car, I drive around my neighborhood collecting things. When I have enough of those bags. Take it to the recycling center. What are you gonna do? People send me lots of emails and like they would say that blah blah blah, you're so cute, you're doing a great job, keep up the good work. If they say what country they're from, I would stick a pin in a map in my room and so then I know what country people have emailed me from. I don't know how many countries I've got emails from, but I think it's at least half my map. Chelsea Clinton has reached out to me. Will Ferrell, I think. Hi, guys. One time I took over somebody's Instagram named LeBron James. I don't even know them. My dad says that they're famous. I'm like, I still have no idea who they are. Okay, watch your toes. I feel pretty good that I'm inspiring lots of other people to recycle. So, no more little Libby oceans and stuff. I just don't really want animals getting sick and dying in the ocean. I know, every week. The money that I get from my recycling, I put that in my bank account to buy a recycling truck so I can keep recycling more. The money from my t-shirts, I donate to the Pacific Marine Mammal Center in Laguna Beach, California. The rescue of seals, sea lions, elephant seals, horrible seals, and northern fur seals. One dollar that I donate, if they use it for fish, one dollar equals one pound of fish. I feel good helping out the Pacific Marine Mammal Center because I know that I'm helping out all the animals. What's next for Ryan's Cycling Company is recycling a million cans or bottles. I'm halfway there, so I bet I could do it. If you would like to start recycling, it's very easy. Just make sure your recycling goes in the correct bin or you could take it to your local recycling center. It's easy as that. Sometimes I see people walk right next to a trash can. They're like, mm. they, they put the can sitting right next to the trash can and walk away. And that's a recycling can. They could have just went shoot right in. It's easy as that. I feel like that they should be recycling better because like I'll, I'll walk right behind it, pick it up, put it in the bin. Let's go people, let's save this planet. What are we waiting for? I just wanted to say thank you for having me here today and I hope I inspired all you guys to be thinking about recycling even more. 
I'm only 10 years old. If a kid like me could do it, anybody could do it. You can follow me on my Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or follow me on my blog, on my website, at Ryan's Recycling, I mean at www.ryansrecycling.com. Thanks for having me here. So does anybody have any questions? We, we only have time for one question. Okay. So we're gonna keep it nice and brief. Huh? Hi Ryan, my name's Natalia. First of all, thank you for everything that you've been doing and all the work that you do to protect our planet and to protect the animals. Thank you, thank you. Um, I was wondering how you and your business have been impacted by replanet closing, because I saw in the video that was where you had been going. Is this forcing mm -hmm. you and your dad to go much further to find a buyback center that will work with your business model? Well, it, it's not really a big deal for my business that we plan it closed because yesterday we, we rented one of those U-Haul trailers and we drove to Santa Ana, which they are helping me too. We, we're trying out some new recycling centers. Uh, there's one in Santa Ana and one in Costa Mesa that they're offering to drive to our house and pick up cans for us. And there you have to take off the caps. They're even offering to take off the caps for us. And, or there's one in Mission Viejo that we're gonna try. So, it's, it's not really a big deal that we plan it closed for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Wow, I think he's the inspiration that we need to fix California's bottle bill. So thank you, Ryan. <laughs> Phenomenal. And Despina, where have you been hiding this great boost? Man, <laughs> that's what my heels are for today. So anyways, it is, it is hard to follow that act. Wow, phenomenal. Thank you, Ryan. I'm going to be introducing our, our next and final keynote for today. Um, I'm going to be introducing Froilan Grote, the executive director of Gaia from Philippines. Froy, Kuya, Froy, I apologize, as he is commonly called, is an environmental educator and volunteer at heart. During his time at the Center for Environmental Awareness and Education, he was first disposed to the transformative power of education, especially as a tool in making people act positively towards the resolution of various environmental issues. He went on to work with the Mother Earth Foundation and today serves as the executive director of Gaia Philippines and as the Asia Pacific coordinator for Gaia. A passionate advocate against the use of plastic, he has not used one single plastic drinking straw or shopping bag in more than 10 years. Thank you for your passion and welcome to the stage. Hello everyone, thank you for having me here. I'm in a tough spot right now, coming after Ryan. Thank you Ryan for all that you do, and also for standing between lunch and the you, so please um, pardon me and I hope you'll indulge me for the next 30 or 40 minutes. I'm very honored to be uh, standing in front of you uh, this morning and uh, to be speaking with you. When I first joined um, my organization in the Philippines and started to work on waste about 15 years ago, I've heard of CRRA, and I wanted to uh, attend your conference. But as a young guy starting to work for a small nonprofit in the Philippines, it was too expensive for me to come here. So it's an honor to be here when Despina wrote and said, would I be interested to speak with you uh, and join you this time? I, without any questions, said yes. So again, uh, thank you for having me here. Um, Yesterday, we've seen pictures of dump sites from Latin America, from Africa, and from Asia. And it reminded us that there's still so much that needs to be done, right? But for the next 30 minutes, um, 
I hope to also give a different side of the story of what's happening on the ground, of communities who are trying to do their part, to be part of the solution, and not just be the poster child of the problem. So that is my goal for uh, this morning. Our, the common narrative that we hear with me he, uh, talk about plastic pollution, marine plastic pollution, are these numbers. By 2050, there'd be more plastic than fish in the ocean. Or when you hear about the Philippines in the news in relation to plastic pollution, this might be a picture of what will be shown on TV, right? Communities suffering from the impacts of plastic pollution, children playing together with um, the waste that we, quote unquote, are responsibly disposing of in the environment. About five years ago, there was this study that was released which identified about 10 Asian and Latin, uh, African countries as responsible for the marine plastic pollution. But for this morning, I'd like to ask you, is that really the case? Are we really to blame for, for this? And maybe we don't have to have an answer this morning, but just to start a conversation and try to answer these questions questions moving forward. And I'll try to answer this by sharing with you my own personal journey of how we work for zero waste in the Philippines and in Asia, and how we try to address our problem with uh, plastic pollution. I am not the hero in this story. I'm just a storyteller. Behind these stories are thousands or even millions of waste pickers who are silently working on this issue for decades now of local officials in the Philippines who, despite limited resources, have been trying to do their part in uh, addressing this problem. And it's an honor to be able to share these stories with you uh, this morning. Uh, for a bit of context, I'm from the Philippines. I grew up in an island. I'm an island boy. So this desert is something new to me. Um, growing up, weekends are spent going to the beach, swimming, or hiking in the mountains. And it's crystal clear water, you know, with fishes around, uh, live corals. And about 18 years ago, uh, I went to Manila to study for the university, and this is what I saw. It was a shock, you know, but also it was fear. Fear knowing that this same thing could happen to the island that I call home if we, do, if we don't do something about it which made me think, what can I do to prevent that from happening? And as an 18-year-old boy, as a, as a teenager rather, again, Ryan, I'm ashamed for what you've been doing at 10 years old. As a teenager, this is what I came up with. Personal things that I can do, saying no to plastic bags, saying no to shampoo in plastic packaging, so going for uh, packaging-free shampoo and toiletries, all simple things, personal things. And I created a list of 10 simple things as well, which I then brought to different schools and gave talks of why we need to do this as a teenager, sharing um, the lessons and what we need to do. And if you will notice, all of this are, are individual actions. Again, after hearing Ryan, I'm embarrassed to show this with you. But this is what I started with, right? But then I realized, you know, I've done hundreds of these workshops, reaching 10,000 students in the first five years that I've been doing this. And the peak of my career, quote unquote, I'm not a mini mogul, but in the peak of my career then was when I entered the bank and the teller said, you don't know me, but I just want to tell you that I have not used straw for three years now because I've attended your workshop. And then I said, I think that's it for me. I'm ready to die, right? <laughs> I've done my part, you know, just changing one person, I think, would be enough. But the reality is that even if I change 10% of the people who went to my workshops, the problem is still there. Waste is still a problem. And so I said to work more on this issue. And the question then for me was, why work on waste? You know, it's not glamorous and financially rewarding in the first place to work in a small nonprofit, much less glamorous to work on waste as an issue. Maybe I'm speaking to the wrong crowd. Right? 
But back then, yeah, it, it, it was an existential question for me. Like, there's so other career, many other careers to work on. Why waste? And then when we look further, we saw that the problem goes deeper. Uh, these numbers might be quite small. This is what every person in the Philippines is producing in terms of waste. And it's sm uh, small compared to what people in developed countries are producing. But I tried to go further, and in one experiment, I really was able to bring it down to two kilograms of waste for one entire year in my household. But then again, the reality is that I'm just one person. I'm not really changing the system. I'm not addressing the problem. And these are some of the problems that we are facing. When we talk to our communities, about 60% of them admitted that they burn their waste as a means of addressing it, right? Out of sight, out of mind. About 43% admitted to throwing their waste in bodies of water. So this is a concern for me personally and for our communities. In urban areas, we have waste collection, where waste are collected and then brought to a landfill or worse, in a uh, dump site or an open dump site in some cases, like this one. So this is a dump site in one of the towns in the Philippines, and if you will notice, it's surrounded by a rice field. And for someone who loves to eat rice, I need, I need to have it every three times a day. <laughs> this is bothering, right? Because we don't know what's going on to the food that we are eating. And this is not an isolated case. There are hundreds more of these dump sites in the country. And if you look closer, there are houses around these dump sites because waste pickers live around this to pick up what can be recovered and sold as their livelihood. 20 years ago, after a massive storm, these uh, mountain of garbage covered these houses, killing hundreds of waste pickers and their families. It's a sad tragedy for the nation, but it was also a moment of reckoning for us. And the national government passed a national law that we call the Ecological Solid Waste Management Act. And it has very good provisions, we believe. Number one, it decentralized waste management down to the lowest level, the barangays or the villages where cities are divided in two. It mandated a source segregation, a materials recovery facility in every village, and all these other nice policies. Uh, we also have a different law, which allowed the Philippines to be the first country with a national ban on incineration. So we don't have incinerators for the whole country yet. <laughs> so NGOs in the Philippines use this as framework for our engagement. And in Mother Earth Foundation, my second NGO, we tried to use this and work with convincing cities and communities that it's in fact, it's possible. And so our first story is really a community in the, the Philippines. It's a town in Manila. And to start this work, we look at our waste. 63% of our waste is actually organics, which is for me not a problem, it's actually an opportunity. And the others are recyclables and residuals. So using our waste audit, we were able to come up with these uh, numbers and we work with one pilot community. It's quite a small village of 15,000 people in the capital. But still imagine 15,000 people throwing their waste every day. So what they do is they pay waste pickers informally to collect the waste and bring it to a transfer station. This is a transfer station. And then the city would send trucks at night to pick up the waste that were collected by the waste pickers. Right? The community said, we're tired of this, enough of this. We want to change this. We want to see, is there a better way of managing our waste? So they work with Mother Earth Foundation, and in three months, we're able to change this place from this into a community park. So this is now a materials recovery facility, quite different than the MRF that you're quite used to. This is very decentralized, very um, community-based for, for the village, enough for 15,000 people, but it serves the purpose. This is where organics is composted, this is where recyclables are stored and sorted, and this is where residuals are stored temporarily for proper collection by the city. Right? And it really involves different stakeholders. The households had to segregate their waste, 
and waste were collected for free, that was the incentive. All you have to do is segregate, we'll collect it for free. And then the village now has to collect the segregated waste, and the city will only collect the residual waste from the village MRF or MRF. And the sorting happens at the household level, and it's not one stream or two stream, it's multiple streams. There's organics for feeding the animals, there are organics for composting, and of course there's recycling and the residuals. And the result of this is we're able to divert 80% of the waste that were collected simply through composting and recycling. But when we look at what's actually generated in the community, we're actually diverting about 92% because households are selling their own um, recyclables or doing their own composting. But this is just for one village. They were able to do this by tapping volunteers to do massive door-to-door -door education campaign, giving them materials on what to do, and then tapping waste pickers to be formal waste collectors who are now paid a regular salary to collect waste every day from the households and we reverse the power dynamics. Because before, households would pay them and have to collect everything. Now, waste pickers can check if it's segregated, they'll collect it. If it's mixed waste, they'll impose a penalty to the household. Right? So it reversed the power dynamics between the waste pickers and the households. This is a typical cartoon of what we're showing to the community when we say, we'll build a MRF in your community. It's a park, you know, it's not a dump site. It's not something you should oppose. It's where we grow our vegetables. So we're trying to change the face of waste for this community. It's something that they welcome. It also changed the lives of the waste pickers. Maybe the numbers are not significant for US standards, but it improved the lives of the waste pickers by giving them a fixed income for the service that they provide now, plus access, exclusive access to all the recyclables that they earn from. So these improve the lives of the waste pickers. So we have this model, but the reality is there are still hundreds more of dump sites all over the Philippines. So we knew then we have to do more. And we partnered with one city. Again, it's not as big as some of your mega cities here. It's only about a million people, daytime population. But we wanted to show that our model can be done at the city level. So we implemented the same system. And in six months, they were able to increase their waste diversion from 13% to 55%. Now they are currently at 80 to 82% waste diversion. I was, I was talking to our friends from SF Environment yesterday and they said they're trying not to emphasize their waste diversion right now because that might give the impression that we've done enough, right? And that's a real danger. But in the Philippines where models are scarce, I think for us, this is a good number to show that it can't be done. This is what's possible for, for the Philippines. We're able to do it by building MRFs in all the 35 villages in the community. So there's 180 decentralized MRFs in um, the city, one for every school, one for every subdivision, and one for every village in the whole city. And in recognition, the waste pickers organize themselves and they sit on the Solid Waste Management Board of the city and their president has one vote equivalent to one vote of the mayor when it comes to all waste issues for the city. As a result of this, the city also decided that they will close their experimental waste to energy facility for two reasons. Number one, most of our waste are organic. It doesn't make sense to, to burn it. And number two, after composting and recycling, they realized we actually don't have enough waste to give to this uh, incinerators and waste to energy facilities. So they close it, right? But then they said, we still are not stopping. We need to do more. And just with composting and recycling, maybe they can achieve as much as 93%. But they want to go beyond that. And they've explored means of how to do that. And for the city, they did the plastic ban. And the common argument is that, you know, it's impossible to implement this in a poor country, in a poor city. But with the right education, with the right system, we've seen that, in fact, it is possible. In six months, 95% of the businesses complied in the city, right? Showing that it can be done in our context. Another 
way that we approach this is the cost of waste management. These are the cities of Metro Manila, the capital. We have 17 cities. One city is spending about 920 million pesos. That's about $20 million just to collect the waste. In some cases, that's about 30 to 40% of the city's budget that goes to waste collection. So if you ask some mayors, why are you not collecting the waste? They said, we'd rather spend the money on health, on education, than on waste collection. So that is part of the problem. San Fernando used to spend 70 million pesos. When they shifted to a zero waste program, they were able to bring it down to 12 million pesos. So that's savings for the city. That's now money that we can use for more schools or more, more health services for the people. Okay. Another city in the Philippines is Tacloban. It's uh, an island in the central Philippines. And prior to implementing a, waste, a zero waste program, using the, they have limited resources. They were only able to collect waste from 30% of the population. After implementing a zero waste program, using the same budget, they were able to expand it to 100% of the population of the city. And when you expand coverage area, commonly the volume of waste would go up as well, right? That is not what happened in Tacloban. Pr prior to it, prior to the zero waste program, 30% coverage, they were landfilling 90 tons of waste. But after covering now from 30 to 100, they were able to reduce what they actually sent to a landfill from 90 tons to 66 tons, increasing the coverage from 30% to 100, but bringing down what they disposed of from 90 to 66 tons per day to the landfill. So our effort right now is on trying to expand this to more cities. Currently, there are 16 cities in the Philippines working on trying to achieve zero waste. And we're not stopping in the Philippines. This is also being done in other countries, in Indonesia, Malaysia, India, and more places right now, right? Just to show that there's appetite, there's interest for this solution to be implemented on the ground as well. But the reality is, even if all of these cities in Asia are able to successfully implement a zero waste program and do our composting and recycling, we still, this, we still have this percentage that in most cases is beyond the capacity of our cities to manage. That is why you are happy to be part of this global movement to break free from plastic. Because now, even small NGOs in the Philippines, even small cities have a platform to say, yes, we have a role, we have a part in this, but we can't solve it on our own, right? We have to involve the corporations who are responsible for dumping these problematic products and packaging in our communities. <clears throat> so a quick um, history of Brave Free from Plastic. We started about three years ago when um, activists gathered in the Philippines, and we created a framework. Uh, there are three strategic pillars. Uh, first one is engaging with corporations. The second one is changing the narrative around plastic. And the third one is the role that cities play, zero waste cities play in addressing our problem of plastic pollution. And we have a diagram to demonstrate how cities play a role in this. So in our zero waste cities, waste is collected Organics is composted, and then recyclables, as much as we can, are being recycled. But the beauty about the zero waste program in this context is that we're not trying to hide our trash or our residuals. Through a tool that we call the Waste and Brand Audit, we're able to propose alternatives to address it, be it banning certain materials or working, working with companies for uh, other ways of delivering their products, or EPR, or redesign of their packaging, right? So this is how we see cities play in addressing the problem of plastic pollution. So briefly, I'd like to share with you more our experience on using the tool, the waste and brand audit. Um, when I started this idea about four years ago, we said, when, until when do we do cleanups? We can't do cleanups forever, right? We have to change the way we do cleanups. And so we've added a different component. After cleaning up Freedom Island, it's a poster boy of the pro problem of plastic pollution in the Philippines, we said we need to do something different this time. So we've added a waste audit 
and a brand audit to really identify who are responsible for these materials and packaging that we pick up when we do our cleanups. And what we found was useful for our campaign. Again, going back on the list of 10 countries, we now asked ourselves, who really is responsible? Is it our fault? Or these 10 companies who are responsible for, again, dumping this useless packaging in our communities? So there are two types of WABA. One that's for cleanups, and for our zero waste that is work, we've also incorporated this. But this one is different because we're trying to study before the waste arrives in our seas and our oceans, right? And if you're interested, there's a link that you can uh, see how it's being done in our households. But the idea really is to identify what are the materials that we are producing. And briefly, I'd like to share some of the results. But if you're interested to know more, there's this website where the full report on the WABA for the Philippines is um, available. So some of the results, what we found was that, in fact, majority of the waste that are beyond the capacities of our cities to manage is actually branded. For the unbranded ones, the plastic bags, the polystyrene food containers, we work with cities to have bans, local bans for these. But for the big brands, a small city in the Philippines cannot say Unilever, we're banning your products, right? So it has to be corporate action. But for the unbranded, it could be local action at the city level. We've also looked at some of the materials. And if you will see, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with sachets. They are multi-layer, multi-material packaging, typically single use for a single serve, um, shampoo, toothpaste, or condiments. That's very common in the Philippines. And more than 50% of our residual waste are actually sachets. The next are the two types of uh, plastic bags. We have also were able to identify plastic bag use. Right? And for the first time, we're able to quantify just how much are we actually producing in terms of these problematic materials. So for plastic bags, every year in the Philippines, we are, um, every day rather, we're using 48 million plastic bags. But what's useful about this is we're able to differentiate places where there is regulation. So you have a national average that's about 174 per person per year. But in San Fernando, the zero waste model, it goes down to about 18 bags per person per year. And that's significant for us to show, to demonstrate that bans actually work. It is useful in terms of bringing down these residual waste. Sachets, we have the pictures here to show uh, some of the examples. And the numbers are staggering. Every day, a person in the Philippines is using about 1.62 mil, uh, uh, piece of sachet. And the common narrative from the industry is that it's because we are too poor to be able to buy something bigger that we're only able to buy products in sachet. But the reality is that they remove the option from us to buy products in bulk. If you go to a supermarket, most of the products are in sachet. And then they blame us for, this, for buying this, right? That translates to about 60 billion sachets every day. So this is, we're able to demonstrate and quantify the problem, which is useful for our advocacy in the Philippines. Again, this is not a normal waste audit. This is a brand audit. And we're able to identify these companies responsible for this packaging. And these 10 companies alone are responsible for 63% of these residual waste. And just four companies are responsible for 41% of these waste. Four multinational companies, Nestle, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, and Coca-Cola. So when they say it's these 10 countries who are responsible for um, the plastic pollution in the ocean, and they should stop um, and do something about it, we say if just these four companies alone would stop using single-use plastic, automatically we'll be able to reduce brought the problem by 41% in the Philippines. So we compared the results from our cleanup and from our cities. And what we found was staggering. Again, not surprising. But in places where communities have no use for a material, this material has the higher tendency to end up in our ocean and our seas. 
So if the same companies responsible for polluting our communities are the same companies responsible for polluting our seas, at least in the Philippine context. Again, looking, uh, going back at the 17 cities and how much they're spending on waste management just for collection, these cities in Metro Manila alone are spending $73 million to manage the waste that's being dumped by these companies. And when you compare their income, they earn $22 billion for one year alone and expect our cities to spend limited resources to manage the problem that they created in the first place. Last April, I had an opportunity to speak at the annual General Assembly of the Nestle stakeholders in Switzerland. And in front of their stakeholders and their board, I had a chance to, to tell them that we are tired of being blamed for the consequences of their decisions that were made in their boardrooms. <laughs> we know we have a role to play, that we can't do it alone. They have to do their part. Their commitments of making their packaging recyclable by X number of years, it's actually meaningless to us. In an island where you have to travel by boat for eight hours, you don't expect pet bottle to be sent back to the capital to be recycled. What we want them to commit is go beyond recyclable and to commit to ensure that their products are actually recycled, meaning they have to be part of making sure that it happens. Right? So with Brave for You, with Gaia, with Mother Earth, our vision is a future free from plastic pollution. I know it's almost time for lunch, but I'd like to uh, show some more pictures um, two, I know we we're talking more on recycling. And yes, recycling has a role. But when you talk about waste diversion in developed countries, when you talk about throwing away our waste, where is that away? These are some pictures from um, Asia. We're talking about recycling, promoting it, but the question is when we promote recycling, where does it go? In 2016, more than half of the waste goes to China, all right? And we've talked uh, extensively about the National Sword in 2017. And as a result, a lot of this waste now goes to Southeast Asian countries. And what does that mean for our communities on the ground? These are the pictures of what is away. This is what could be your waste diversion. This is not waste generated in the community. This is waste that was sent to Indonesia for recycling. These products are not sold in the domestic markets, but these are the products we found in these mountains of garbage that were sent to us for recycling. It's happening in Indonesia, it's happening in Malaysia. We are exporting the dirty part of the recycling. When China closed their borders on recycling with a national sword, what it really means is that they said no to the dirty part because the pre-processing happens in Indonesia, in Thailand, in Vietnam, but once it's pre-processed, then it's okay to be sent to China, right? So we are externalizing the dirty part of the recycling. They say there's money in garbage, and literally we found dollars and euros and uh, British pound, right? This is your waste diversion. After communities are able to recover what could be recycled, which is in some cases 10% of the containers that were sent to us, they then burn this, right? Because there's no use for this in the community. If you're interested to know more of these stories, there's this website that you can go. There are more stories about how this waste trade is impacting communities in Southeast Asia, especially after the China ban. Now, with this problem highlighted, we're fighting, as I said, the Philippines is the first country to ban incineration. Now companies are saying, no, to solve the problem, let's just build incinerators. The US have done it, Europe is doing it. If you want to be a modern country, you need to build incinerators the way they've, doing it, they've been doing it in the US and in Europe, right? So we have to fight these false solutions. And lastly, um, or second to the last, I'd like to share this quote, and my request for everyone is that in our quest to, to save the turtles, in our quest to save the marine animals, hopefully we don't pollute the Asian communities that are 
bearing the brunt of um, the waste management crisis that we are right now. So going back for us, it's about knowing the problem and looking at opportunities. And our effort right now in, in the Philippines, we have uh, 7,000 plus islands. In Indonesia, we have 13,000 plus islands. Our project right now is to build models that is um, ideal for this island setting, right? And again, just to summarize how zero waste is, might be different with us, um, zero waste for us makes sense as compared to the, the traditional waste management system because one, it's decentralized. It's about giving power to the community. Second, it creates jobs for the people. It is less intensive in terms of capital and it doesn't lock in waste generation. Uh, we had an interesting lunch yesterday that yes, you're doing amazing work here in the US, but there's this one question. Our consumption here is still quite high. Every time I go to the US, I went back to the Philippines with at least two pounds gaining weight. <laughs> because the portions are so big, the choice is do you create food waste or do you eat all of it, <laughs> right? So um, how do we ensure that these systems do not encourage us to produce more? Again, cost is very important to us. And using these examples, we've seen that in fact, zero waste is the way for us. It's a lot cheaper for us to implement zero waste than landfill or incinerators, or compared to cleaning up the ocean, scooping all the plastic that's already there. It's more better, it's a better way to use limited resources if we implement zero waste in our communities. And uh, lastly, with this quote, uh, zero waste is possible. The work that you're doing he here is helping the work that we're doing in our part of the world. It's moving the needle, it's making work easier for us, so thank you for that. And remember, yes, you are the champions here, but work is also happening in our part of the work. And with that, I'd like to thank you and thank you for all the work that you do. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have a lot of, we're already over time, so we're gonna take two, maybe three questions. Let's keep them super brief. I've got one over here. You got one? Okay. Just really quick, thank you so much. Incredible. Um, how is medical waste or electronic waste fit into this program, especially with incineration and medical waste? Thank you so much. So we, we have groups, oh, sorry. Uh, so we have groups working on this issue in the Philippines right now. So um, autoclave is being promoted as a solution for uh, medical waste. For hazardous waste, there's a separate law that mandates the management of it. Um, and I could share uh, more information on that, but it's separate. But uh, the short answer is it's a, sig a small amount of our waste right now. And there are already regulations to address it. Of course, implementation is always not perfect, but um, regulations are actually quite good. Okay, last question, right here. First of all, thank you so much for everything that you've done. Um, you've inspired all of us here today. Um, my question is, so in your community-based solutions, um, you haven't been able to divert all the waste, so do you create new landfills, or what do you do with the waste that's left? So our study actually um, showed us that we have enough landfill capacity. The problem right now is everything's being sent right to the, to the landfill, right? And when you're able to divert both through composting, recycling, or waste reduction, then this existing landfill capacity is able to accept um, uh, the small portion that's left. So that's where uh, the small portion is going at this point. Hopefully, with our uh, campaign with the corporations, we'll, you won't have this uh, problematic waste to deal with in the future, but currently, uh, the only thing that's being done is for these residual waste to be sent to a landfill. Thank you again, uh, and enjoy lunch. Wow, that was amazing. 
Um, so a little housekeeping here, uh, 12.30 to 2.30, lunch in the exhibit hall. Make sure you get your passport filled out if you've already done so, great prizes. Um, if you're going to the Cork meeting, it's in AMB3, which is behind us. Uh, Nick Rue players tonight at 8.30. Oh, and come to the CRA members meeting, 1.30, 2.30, AMB1. And lastly, you gotta go see Ryan, he's in the Bush Systems booth. Thanks, have a great day.